this week. As time goes by, as you realize that baseball is blessed with some ballparks with fabulously rich tradition, Yankee Stadium, Wrigley Field, and of course Fenway Park. With its green monster wall out in left field and its cozy size, Fenway has a look and feel all its own. It's a wonderful place to watch a game. And the Red Sox have called it home for a long time. A legend in baseball, Fenway Park. No one can stop the passing of time, but in some places, time seems to pass more slowly. In a ballpark, for instance, especially this ballpark. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Welcome to Fenway Park, home of the Boston Red Sox. A lyric little band box, as our writer John Updike once put it, Visiting players may not care to put it as fondly, but there is a strange lyric logic to the way in which foul lines, poles, screens, and multi-dimensional walls jigsaw and juxtapose one another to pose such endless puzzles and hazards to players. Fenway is baseball's oldest and smallest ballpark. It holds together the local color of New England, the air of history, and enough off-the-wall quirks to make a baseball game appear not quite the same as it would in other places. Familiar as the sunset is to the evening, so is this ballpark to Red Sox baseball. Fenway did, however, have a forerunner, the Huntington Avenue Baseball Grandstand, which held less than 10,000 overflowing fans. That was before a new owner named John I. Taylor turned the Boston Americans into the Boston Red Sox, while commissioning blueprints for construction of a larger park in Fenway. It opened in 1912 with a left field wall even odder than the one that stands today. A 10-foot mound called Duffy's Cliff, where fans and left fielder Duffy Lewis became most uncommonly acquainted. The Red Sox also found 1912 uncommonly successful, largely because their fireballing ace Smokey Joe Wood went 34 and 5 that year. Wood armed up against the great Walter Johnson in a September pitching duel of historic, if not hysteric, proportions. Smokey Joe derailed the big train one zip before leading the Red Sox with three victories over the Giants to a world championship. The Red Sox appeared primed to win many more, and behind a young pitcher named Babe Ruth, quickly won three more world titles before the infamous Harry Frazee sold Ruth and several other stars to the Yankees. If that didn't, as some insist, make the roof cave in, a fire in 1926 did make the bleachers cave in. The bleachers weren't restored until 1934 when a young and deeply devoted owner named Thomas A. Yawkey initiated long-lasting changes at Fenway. Yawkey purchased the club several days after inheriting a small fortune and quickly spent two million depression dollars by installing lights, replacing much of the wooden structure with concrete and erecting an impossible left field wall, which would later come to be known as the Big Green Monster. The ballpark soon became a favorite of fans and players alike, and not surprisingly, so did Mr. Yawkey. Mr. Yawkey comes over and he, so he says, uh, Bernardo, I'm Mr. Yawkey. And he sits down with me and starts talking. I couldn't believe it was Mr. Yawkey. I said, here's the owner of the ball club. He's got a work t-shirt, brown pants, work shoes on, and talking to Bernie Carbone. He calls me Bernardo. And after that, I came to the ballpark early almost every day just to talk with him. He was like my grandfather. Tom Yawkey passed away in 1976, leaving his initials along with those of his wife, Jean, stamped in Morse code upon the park as a subtle reminder that not even death can separate the Yawkeys from Fenway. Most ballparks have a lot of commercials on the wall. That white or yellow, uh, when it merges with the baseball coming out of the pitcher's hand, 
becomes difficult to see. And uh, Yaki, of course, uh, was number one uh, a fan, probably the greatest baseball fan of all time. He loved baseball, and he showed it in every way. We'll have more from Fenway Park, including an inside look at the big green monster right after these messages. And still to come, we'll go down memory lane with Johnny Bench when Stroh's Circle of Sports continues. Despite the smallest seating capacity in the majors and despite the ups and downs of the Red Sox, Fenway Park still draws a healthy flow of very loyal fans, same as it has for many decades. The fans who, who are associated with this ballpark, all of us feel a part of it. Uh, I don't believe in ghosts, but uh, sometimes uh, you can walk in here with the lights dimmed at night after when the cleanup crews are there, and you can remember an awful lot of the things that have happened. As when Ted Williams happened to be batting in his home park, when Rip Sewell delivered his renowned Ephus pitch during the 1946 All-Star Game, Ephus got creamed, and so did the National League as Williams homered twice in an 11 to nothing victory. I was the uh, bat boy for the National League All-Star team, and it was very thrilling and exciting because there was a lot of kidding between the dugout and Teddy. And they knew that the Sewell it was who threw the pitch, and Teddy just smiled, bink, popped it out of here, and really popped it. I was the clubhouse man in the home side when Teddy hit his last home run, and I was with him in the clubhouse for a good 20 minutes after that, he and I alone. And All Alone often describes how many a player is made to feel when contending with the imperatives of Fenway's territorial or conspiratorial dimension. This is a ballpark that is conducive to a humor, and strange things happening, no question about it. I've seen baseball players chase baseballs around Fenway Park and get them mixed up with a dog. Uh, we've had a dog out there, a cat, uh, birds of all kinds, a rat, uh, a rabbit. We've had all kinds of animals. I don't know where they've come from, by the way, and there wasn't even a circus in town. Of course, Boston hardly needs the big top when it has its own monster, or green monster, as some call the cozy but towering left field wall. Some tell stories of how the monster turned flies into homers, homers into singles, or how it turned the score around. Um, I remember a story last year, opening day, they were playing the Detroit Tigers, and um, a kid I was out here working with put one of the yellow numbers up, because when you put a yellow number up, you put it in when the inning is still going on, and you put the number up backwards, and I guess a lot of people caught it on TV and it was in the paper. The wall will act as friend or foe depending on the point of view, but those who've had a bird's eye point of view claim the wall becomes friendlier if you understand it properly. To play the wall right, properly, you have to uh, use your complete physical uh, ability plus a very astute mental ability. For instance, Ted Williams, when he first came here to play, he wasn't exceptionally fast. He couldn't throw outstandingly, but as the years went along and he worked at it and worked at it, he became an outstanding left fielder for this ballpark. Kaya Strunsky came. He played left field. He had more physical ability than Teddy. He could play a little better that way to start with, but he developed, also improved himself, and they both mentally conquered that wall as pertaining to the game. Notice it sometimes. Watch them. Watch the guys that hardly ever played and you see how awkward they look compared to someone who plays here a lot. And with the wall 315 feet away, many pitchers wish they didn't have to pitch there at all. In fact, Yankee ace left-hander Whitey Ford scarcely did. Whitey Ford was here for an inning and Stengel bought him a six-pack and sent him back to Kenmore Hotel and said, you'll never pitch there again. Boston fans may have preferred to see more of Ford or the Red Sox win the World Championship, which has eluded them since 1918, but they've seen enough to know that Fenway Park baseball is hard to beat. The primary thing that the fan in New England, not only Boston, New England wants, is a good representative team. 
And they've had their share of wonderful athletes and wonderful successes. They've won tennis, but they haven't won the World Series, but they've had hundreds of thrills. And, and they've accepted that. And someday they will win the World Series. And I hope I'm around to see it.